Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part three of Double Act by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from chapter six. It's awful, we knew it would be, it's like a little toy school, there's hardly any playground, there aren't any computers, there isn't even a television, the teacher writes stuff up on a blackboard and we sit at these dinky little desks with lids and inkwells, it's like the sort of classroom you get in a cartoon. Miss Debenham isn't a bit like that Ruby, this is Miss Debenham. Yes, and she made me feel positively sick and squirm me inside when she stood us in front of the class and introduced us. And as we needed, as if we needed introducing anyway. We're famous in this dreary dump of a village. Everyone knows us. Especially Jeremy Treadgold and his gang. Fancy that great blob being in our class. It's a wonder he can cram himself into the teeny weeny desk. Imagine having to sit next to him. I'm glad we can sit together anyway. Miss Debenham asked us what we'd prefer. Teachers don't usually ask you stuff like that. They just tell you what they want you to do, and I like some of the lessons, like when we had to write about twins. You can be a real smarmy little creep at times. I had it all sussed out. The good things about being a twin, everything. The bad things about being a twin, nothing. And then you were supposed to do your mirror writing trick. It would have been so brilliant. The good things about being a twin, the bad things about being a twin. It would have been perfect, an answer and a twin answer, identical like us. But oh no, Miss Suck up to the teacher, smarty farty, has to write all that rubbish. The good things about being a twin. There are lots and lots of good things about being a twin. You're never alone. You've always got a best friend to talk to and play with. You can have all sorts of special secrets and make up wonderful games that no one else can ever understand. You can say things together and do things together so that you can have twice the power. The bad things about being a twin. There aren't many bad things about being a twin, just occasionally it might be peaceful to be alone, not to have to talk or make, make up games or listen to secrets, just to be yourself, not part of anyone else, you. Very bad, Garnet. Do you really want to be left alone? OK, I'll run off the next time that Big Blob tries to get us. Oh, that was so awful. He crept up on us with this huge great wiggly worm in either hand, and I can't stand worms. Well, I'm not exactly enchanted with them myself, especially not squirming down my jumper, but... I got mine out. I shoved it straight down the big blob's trousers. Judy said he once put a war worm down her neck too. Judy just about went bananas. She said, I'm not the slightest bit interested in Judy and what she said. I don't know why you wanted to go off with her. She, she's quite nice, Ruby. Really she is. And I didn't go off with her. You know that. Miss Debenham said she wanted us to do this big Noah's Ark painting to brighten up the classroom wall. And she was going around the whole form asking them which animal they wanted to paint. And I kept hoping nobody else would pick bag a giraffe, because they're our favourite animal. So when she got to us, I said, giraffe, quick. And Miss Debenham smiled at you too and said, and you'll do a twin giraffe, right, Ruby? So I said, wrong, Miss Debenham. I don't want to paint any stupid old giraffe. But why did you say that? And why did you have to choose a flea for your animal? Simple. One little blob. Flea finished. And if you'd only shut up and waited for me to answer old Dumbo Debenham, you could have done a flea too. Then we could have just sat and mucked around for the rest of the lesson. But oh no, you have to go off with that ghastly Judy girl and paint stupid giraffes with her. I didn't go off. Well, not deliberately. I couldn't help it that Judy said she wanted to do a giraffe too. And I tried to back out. You know I did. But Miss Debenham said, no, come on, Garnet. You said you'd like to do a giraffe. So you can do the giraffes with Judy. Never mind what Ruby wants to do. Yes, never mind me. Oh, Ruby, don't be like that. I'll be exactly how I want. If you want to pal around with Judy, then fine. You go off with her. I don't want to pal around with her. So why did you get your ta her tag around with us at playtime then? Going gab, gab, gab until I felt like punching her on the gob. Well, what could I do? I couldn't tell her to go away. I could. You did. You were ever so rude to her. And I kept telling you, Ruby, she's good fun. She really is. You'd like her if you could bother to get to know her. I'm not going to get to know any of them, okay? You go and have good fun with your super new friend. Pal around with her all you like. Just don't expect to pal around with me. Ruby, don't let's quarrel. I hate it so. Ruby, come back, please. Chapter 7. Ruby? I can't stand it when Ruby won't talk to me. It's as if most of me goes missing. As if my own mouth won't work. My own hands won't hold. She's right. I was crazy to write that stuff about being a twin. It's awful being on your own. Ruby wouldn't talk to me all yesterday evening. When I tried saying anything, she put her hands over, ear, over her ears and went blah, 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 so she couldn't hear. After we'd had tea, Ruby went up to our room and started reading an old Beano annual. I said I was sorry, but she didn't look up. I tried putting my arm around her, but she wriggled away. I took hold of the Beano annual to make her look at me, but she grabbed it back and hit me on the head with it. 
It hurt quite a lot, but that wasn't really why I was crying. Ruby didn't take any notice at all. My nose started to run so badly that I had to go and get a tissue. Rose saw me before I could mop myself up. Oh, sweetie, she said, and she pulled one of her chiffony scarves off her neck and wiped my nose with it. Hey, I'm just popping down to that video shop because there's nothing good on telly tonight. Come and help me choose a good film, eh? I didn't know what to do. I knew Ruby would never forgive me if I palled up with Rose, but it didn't look like she would ever forgive me anyway. Come on, we'll get some chocks too, said Rose. She rubbed her tummy. I've put on a good half stone since we got here. Still, never mind, eh? I wanted to go with Rose. Ruby might not even know unless she looked out of our window. No, who was I kidding? It's like Ruby can look through a little window straight into my head. I better not, I mumbled to Rose. I mean, I don't feel like it. You don't always have to do what Ruby wants, Rose said. She can tell us apart now, unless we deliberately trick her. She thinks she's getting to know us, but she can't ever really understand. I don't always get it myself, but I do have to do what Ruby wants, because if I don't, this happens, and it's so horrid. Rose usually chooses love, love films with big hunky men, but this time she brought back The Railway Children. It's one of my all-time favourite films, but generally when we watch it, Ruby mucks around and mocks all the accents, and at the end, when Bobby runs to her father at the station and it's so lovely, Ruby makes sick noises and switches, switches it off before it's finished. Dad raised his eyebrows a bit when he saw which film it was, but he didn't say anything. He usually sits on the sofa with Rose, but this evening he sat in the armchair and he caught hold of me and sat me on his lap, while Rose put her feet up on the sofa, a box of Cadbury's dairy milk balanced on her tummy. She kept throwing Dad and me chocolates. I said I wasn't very hungry, thanks, but Dad popped my favourite chocolate fudge into my mouth as I spoke, and I couldn't really spit it out. They were being so nice to me, but it didn't work. The chocolate didn't have any taste. The railway children got started, but I couldn't watch it properly. I kept glancing up at the ceiling, at Ruby crouched up above, us all on her own. Why don't we ask if she feels like coming down now, Rose said. Dad and I looked at each other. Rose certainly doesn't understand Ruby yet. Rose went up all the same. She left a couple of chocolates beside Ruby. They weren't touched when I came to bed. Ruby and I always share the bathroom and do synchronised tooth cleaning, but Ruby barged straight past me and banged the door in my face. When we got into our nighties in the bedroom, she seemed to be staring straight through me as if I didn't exist. That was exactly the way I felt. When we were in bed with the light off, I kept whispering to her, but she wouldn't answer. I lay awake for ages and ages and ages. In the middle of the night, I slipped out of my bed and climbed in beside Ruby. She was snoring softly, deep in a dream, but she still wouldn't cuddle up. And after a while, I crept back to my own bed. I think I slept a bit, but now I'm wide awake again, even though it's not properly morning. I think Ruby's awake too. Ruby? She's still not speaking, but I know what to do now. I did it. And we're friends again now, aren't we, Ruby? Yeah, okay, okay. Get off me, Garnet. Make friends, make friends, never, never break friends. I said, didn't I? Write it too. Write it down here in the accounts book. Write that you'll never break friends with me again. I will never break friends with my twin sister and best friend Garnet Barker. Oh, you've really written it and put I swear. I swear my twin sister and best friend Garnet Barker is driving me completely batty with all this sloppy junk. And if she doesn't shut up soon, I might well go back on my promise. You can't do that. No backsies. I was only teasing, stupid. Here, that's all the drivel you've been writing, whimpering on about me for page after page. Don't look at it now. You're right, it was just rubbish. So you had chocolate fudge downstairs, did you? I didn't mean to. I just had my mouth open and, oh well, I might as well eat my chockies too. One, yum, yum, yum. And two, gobble, gobble, gobble. Didn't look at me like that. Don't look at me like that. You had yours last night. Only one. Well, look here. It's all chewed and slobbery. Well, we're twins, aren't we? Your slobber is the same as my slobber. My drool is the same as your drool. My spit is the same as your spit. Your spit is a lot splashier than mine. Hey, wasn't it great today when we got Jeremy Blob splat splat? Oh boy, oh boy. That was the most terrific supersonic idea of mine, eh? Going up to him in the playground and saying stuff ever so softly. So he shakes his head and screws up his face. What? He says, I can't hear you. So we go, then wash your ears out. And you spit splat and I spit splat in his ears. I wish Miss Debenham hadn't been walking around the playground, though. She wasn't very pleased either when I said I didn't want to finish my giraffe and I did a twin flea to match yours. And Judy was a bit fed up too because now she's lumbered doing one and three quarters giraffes by herself. Still, we don't care, do we? It doesn't matter, so long as we've got each other. So now school's a doddle because Garnet and I don't do anything. We just sit looking blank when Dumbo Debenham gets onto us. 
or I wrote the barest minimum and Garnet does mirror writing, or we copy everything twice. Two lots of sums, two maps, two fact sheets, because we say everything's got to be doubled because we're, double, uh, we're a double ourselves. Double trouble, said Dumbo Debenham, and she sighed and tried separating us. Garnet right at the back of the class and me at the front. It didn't work. Garnet just had to keep her eye on me. I'd tilt my head one way and that was the signal to sneeze simultaneously, or I'd tilt my head the other way and we'd both tip our books off the desk. Or I'd nod very slightly and we'd both stand up and say in unison, please may I go to the toilet, Miss Debenham? And then we'd walk out, keeping step, me first, Garnet second, left, right, left, right, our arms swinging, right, left, right, left. And then when I gave the slightest little cough, we'd toss our heads so that our plaits would go left, right, left, right, over our shoulders. And all the kids would stare with their mouths open. We even spooked Jeremy Blob. <laughs> but it looks like we're in double trouble with Dad. Dumbo Debenham phoned him up and told tales on us. So, why are you acting so stupidly at school, Dad demanded. I think they act stupidly at home too, said Rose. We only act. Stupid. Too stupid. People, we said. But then Dad shook us. Hard. I thought he might even bang our heads together. Stop it. I won't have you talking to Rose like that. What's the matter with you? I just don't get it. You've always been such good girls. Well, you've had your moments, Ruby, but you've never ever behaved as badly as this before. And you've both always done so well at school. I've been so proud of you. But now it sounds as if you're going out of your way to be as naughty and disruptive as possible. And you're not, in, not even trying to make friends with the other children. Miss Debenham says you've got into silly fights with some of the boys. And you really upset one of the girls yesterday. Judy, someone? That was great. She was carrying on with this boring, boring Noah's Ark nonsense, and she just got started during the giraffe's long neck with brown paint. So I got Garnet, <laughs> and we did our wanting to wee double act, and then as we went out we both bumped into Judy accidentally on purpose, and her giraffe ended up with this amazing corkscrew neck. Shame. I couldn't help sniggering just thinking about it, and Dad got madder than ever. Garnet sported a bit because she started snivelling, as always. Then Dad sighed and said, Why do you always have to copy Ruby? Garnet, you're, you've obviously tried hard at school to, at first, but now you're starting to be just as naughty as Ruby. And then he shook me a bit and said, why can't you ever copy Garnet, Ruby? But Garnet was okay. I don't copy Rudy, she, Ruby, she says. I don't copy Garnet, I said. And then I sniffed because I knew Garnet was just about to, and I rubbed my dry eyes and she rubbed her wet ones. And then Garnet knew I'd stare at Dad defiantly with my chin up, so she did it too. It unnerved Dad, even though he's used to us. But Rose clapped her hands. They ought to go on stage, she said. Well, ha <laughs> ha we're going to, I said. Garnet was a bit slow with her response this time. She only managed a going to, and she sounded a bit half-hearted. But I'm her other half, the oldest, biggest, bossiest half. We have to do what I say. Chapter 8. This is it, our big chance. <laughs> we were sitting in the kitchen on Saturday, mucking about. Dad was down in the shop. Rose had caught the early bus to the into town. We had the place to ourselves. Garnet mixed up some flour and water and started making dinky little doe twins. She even plaited their hair and gave them little laces in their trainers. I said I wanted mine to have Doc Martins, all the better for kicking. <laughs> and I tried to change their shoes, but they wouldn't go right. So I squashed my twin up and started all over again. But it just went all blobby. I turned it into Jeremy Blob instead, while Garnet made another one. Then I got some toothpicks and tortured Jeremy Blob until he stopped looking like a doe boy and turned into a porcupine. I got fed up with dough, then, and folded up a newspaper and cut it out carefully, the way Gran showed us once and once. And then, when I unfolded it, there was this whole row of paper dolls. The newspaper just happened to be Rose's guardian, and she hadn't even opened it yet. Tough. I got a felt tip and started scribbling in eyes and mouths and buttons down the front of each little paper girl. I'm not dead artistic like Garnet. I can't be bothered to be so finicky. I'm turning them all into twins, I said. I did a smiley mouth for me and a little oh, anxious mouth for Garnet and then a smiley mouth for me and a... And then I stopped because I saw the word twin on the paper doll. I read her skirt and then I ferreted around for the leftover paper to try to read the rest. I got the sellotape and started trying to stick the whole bang sh shoot back together again. Yes, Rose is going to want to read that when she gets back, Garnet mumbled, putting the finishing touches to the little doe me. Blow Rose reading it. We've got to read it, I said and I was so shaking with excitement that I stuck myself together with the sellotape. Garnet, come and take a look at this. Oh boy, no, oh girl, oh twin girl. Whatever are you burbling about, said Garnet. Hey, don't jog, look, you've made me muck up your plat now. Leave it, look. I shoved the crumpled sellotape sheet of paper in front of her nose. Wanted, girl twins. 
Sunny Lee Productions are going to turn Enid Blyton's much-loved Twins at St Clair's books into a children's television serial. Auditions start on Monday for the plum parts. The twins themselves, so any likely lively outgoing twin girls aged 10 to 14, with showbiz ambitions, can show up at 10 New Lake Street, London W1, at 9 o'clock. This is it, Garnet, I shouted. Garnet is usually a quick reader, but she seemed to be taking her time getting through one small paragraph. She was still holding the little doe me. Hey, watch out, you're spoiling me, I said. Garnet squashed me into a little ball and then dropped me on the kitchen floor. No, she said. What? No, I can't. What do you mean? We can, we can, we can, we can. Yes, all right, it's going to be difficult getting to London by nine o'clock. We'll have to get up ever so early. Rose will have to look after the shop herself while Dad drives us. Still, that'll be fun. No. Yes. Now we're going to have to work mega fast preparing our audition number. Get the book, quick, and we'll learn one of the scenes. Ruby, I can't. I can't act for Toffee. You know I can't. Look, it'll be fine. I promise you, you won't wet yourself this time. Stop it. It's not funny. I don't want to be in showbiz. Look, you go if you want, but I'm not. Oh, ha ha ha. Very helpful. How can I audition as a twin by myself, eh? Take one of the little doe twins along with me. Don't be such a dope. Now, where's the book? We've got to get cracking. Which twin is which? I'll be the one that says the most. We'll work it out so that you don't have to say hardly anything, okay? No, Ruby, please, please. Garnet started scrabbling at me, getting dough all over my jumper. We can't miss out on this, Garnet. It's our big chance. We've got to go for it. But it says lively. I'm not a bit lively. I don't jump about like you. I just sort of flop in a corner and I'm not outgoing. I'm as inward being as you could possibly get. You'll be okay. Just copy me. Why do I always have to copy Ruby? I can't act. I don't want to act. I can't go to an audition in London. I can't say a lot of stuff with everyone watching. It'll be even worse than being a sheep. Why won't Ruby understand? She won't listen to me. She's rifling through the twins at St Clair's right this minute, trying to choose which bit will act out. Only I'm not going to act. I can't, can't, can't act. Remember what Gran says? There's no such word as can't. Now stop scribbling and start spouting. We've got to, it's got to be word perfect by Monday. It's okay. I don't have to act after all. Dad won't let us. I can't believe he could be so mega mean. He doesn't seem to see this is our one big chance, tailor-made for us. He won't even take it seriously. Don't be daft, Ruby, as if I'm going to drive you all the way to London at the crack of dawn on Monday, and I don't want you and Garnet involved in any acting caper while you're still children. I can't stick those simpering stage school kiddiewinks. You're already enough of a show-off as it is. What a cheek. He can't be bothered to keep her, help us achieve our all-time ambition. Your ambition? And yet, look what we've had to do for him. We've had to leave Gran and all our friends and our old school and come and live in this horrible, dusty old dump in the middle of boring, bleak, rainy old country, which is all mud and sheep and nothing else. And he says we've got to have old Rosie Ratbag as our mother. Stepmother? And Rose said she didn't fancy herself as a stepmother anyway, and she didn't want us to feel she was forever trying to slip us poisoned apples. She said she just wanted to be our friend. Well... We don't ever, 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 ever want to be friends with her, do we? Do we, Garnet? I, I suppose not. No, but she's not really as bad as all that. And she said she didn't see why we couldn't go to the audition. She said she thought she, we'd walk away with the parts. She told Dad not to be so stuffy. She said she'd even get up early on Monday and drive us in the van. Yes, but she didn't really mean it. She knew Dad would put his foot down and say no. Still, she did stick up for us. Look, what is this? The Rosie Ratbag Appreciation Society? You'll be writing a fanzine about her next. Save your appreciation for us. The talented gems of stage and screen, identical twins Ruby and Garnet Barker, who first sprang to stardom in the acclaimed television serial The Twins at St Clair's. Only we're not going to be in The Twins at St Clair's. Oh yes, we are. Dad won't let us. He won't ever change his mind. He's like you. He, he won't take us. I know he won't take us. So we'll take ourself. What? I'll fix it. We can't miss this chance. Come on, Garnet. Twin grin. Smile. Ruby won't be able to fix it, will she? I did fix it. I prodded my brain box into action and charged out on Saturday afternoon to arrange things. I phoned the station to check on train times. I went into the video shop and ordered the taxi for quarter past five on Monday morning. Mr Baines, the video man, is also the taxi man. And he's also a nosy old git who wanted to know why we were going to the station to catch the early train. I spun in this tale about it being Gran's birthday. 
He seemed to take it for granted that Dad was going to be visiting her too. Then I went to the nearest antique shop and tried to sell my silver locket and my wristwatch and a dopey old china baby doll that Gran gave me. I never liked it even when I was little. Garnet played with mine as well as hers, but the doll was mine and the locket and the watch. But the antique shop lady wouldn't buy them. She said I had to have mummy or daddy with me. Well, I haven't got a mummy or much of a dad. I tried the next antique shop. No go and the last one useless. But did I give up? Nope. I went to the car boot sale in the field by the river on Sunday morning. No one was very interested in my chain and my watch, but I saw them get excited about the doll, even though they tried to act like they couldn't be bothered. They offered me a fiver, like they were doing me a favour. I'm not daft. I asked for 50. Of course, <laughs> they didn't give me 50, but they gave me 20, which wasn't going to be enough for the taxi and the train fare, even with all our savings in our piggy bank. So, when my alarm went off at four in the morning, I sneaked downstairs while Garnet was still asleep and pinched a note or two out of the till. It isn't really stealing if it's your own family, is it? If you're going to pay them back anyway, well, all right, it is, but I had to. Then I went and woke Garnet and we bumbled about in the dark getting ready in our best clothes. And then we crept downstairs and snaffled some biscuits for breakfast and then stood outside the front door waiting for Mr. Baines so that he wouldn't ring the bell and wake Dad or Rosie Ratbag. They were still fast asleep. I checked. Mr. Baines was ten minutes late, so I was in a bit of a tizzy in case we were going to miss the train. And then he held things up by asking where Dad was. And he got this incredibly loud voice, and I was sure he was going to wake everyone up. But I rose to the occasion. I spun him this story about Dad having a tummy bug and being unable to travel. But Graham was so disappointed when he rang her that he promised to send us in on our own. Two little girls like you, said Mr. Baines, doubtfully. But I showed him my bulging purse and told him Graham was meeting us off the train. So he shrugged and said OK. Garnet didn't say a word. She still seemed half asleep. Then she went green in the taxi. I'm the one who gets travel sick, but I was perfectly OK. I even remembered to give Mr. Baines a tip. Thought I didn't think he really, de although I thought I didn't think he really deserved it being late and asking hundreds of questions all the way. I bought the tickets for the train. Garnet wasn't with me. She was being sick behind a hedge. I was worried she might muck up her best jacket. You can't audition attractively with vomit all down your front. But she was quite neat about it, though she looked greener than ever when she came back. Still, our jackets are green, so at least she matched. She was all shivery, even on the train. I made her rehearse a bit, and she got even more trembly and tearful. Don't you dare cry, I said. Don't you want to be all red-eyed and bleary at the audition? She did, a cry she did cry a bit, even so, but I mopped her up in the ladies, too. You're not going to let me down, are you, Garnet? I said very fiercely. Sometimes you've got to be fierce to get what you want. But even I felt a bit timid when we got off the train because it was all so big and busy and we didn't know where to go and we asked someone where New Lake Street was and they'd never even heard of it. And I said we'd get a tube but we didn't know which tube or where and we went back down the escalator and then back up the escalator and then I saw a taxi sign and we still had some money in our purse so we took a taxi. Turned out we didn't have quite enough money after all. The taxi driver got a bit narked but I wasn't bothered about that. I was bothered about something else. I got out, of, got out of the taxi and Garnet staggered out after me and we stared and hundreds of eyes stared back at us. Twin eyes, twin after twin after twin after twin. And that is where we will leave part three of Double Act by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.